Well, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Kilner. <coughs> Is my mic on and working? All right. Well, it's kind of fun because that's the first time I've been professionally introduced as Dr. Cunningham. It's less than a month since I finished, so I'm still kind of in that recovery zone. <laughs> How many of you actually know where the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity is here on campus? Well, that's a pretty good showing. There are people who graduate from Trinity and still have no clue as to where it is. <laughs> so very impressive. Well, tonight we're going to do something a little different than just a straight lecture, and that is we're going to look at bioethics issues through the lens of empirical research. Um, this is in contrast with a lot of PhDs and a lot of bioethical studies which are more theoretical or conceptual. Empirical research is a really important part of the field of bioethics. And if you go to the annual meetings of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, you will find that between 25 and 30 percent of the presentations every year are based on empirical research, either quantitative or qualitative. When I say quantitative, what comes to mind? Anybody know what quantitative research tends to involve? Numbers. Numbers. Re, uh, surveys, things that can be quantified. Qualitative is different. Qualitative involves um, conversations with people and the meaning they make of their experiences. And I did a qualitative study, which we're going to be digging into a little bit. So what you're going to get is a window into my process as a doctoral student, grappling with the issues of bioethics in the church today. And Dr. Kilner mentioned why the church needs bioethics. I think we're at the point where there's a question mark after that. Does the church need bioethics? Because we look at the responsiveness of the church, and I think part of the response is, no, we don't need it. We, we're just too busy. We don't care. And so this is the challenge that we're dealing with, is we believe the church does need it. But how we get them to care about it is something I'm going to actually invite you to participate with me a little bit this evening in thinking about. So how many of you have ever attended an evangelical church? And how many of you have ever observed an evangelical pastor? All right, you're qualified to participate. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is talk about how I identified the problem. When you're doing a research study, you have to identify what your research problem is. And it changed from when I began, although it ended up kind of in the same area, but I reframed it after I did all my coursework and was beginning to think more like a researcher and less like an advocate. I had come out of 20 years in the pro-life movement and very much with advocacy and sound bites. Thinking like a scholar is different. And so I was changed by my, uh, by my studies. So I'm going to talk about how I identified the research problem, how I did the research. That's called methodology. And there won't be too much of that, but just to give you an overview of what I did. Then what I found out about pastors and their moral leadership in bioethics. That's called the findings. And then what I learned about the congregation and church members, and what I learned or observed about the pastors, that's the discussion part of the dissertation. And then questions for the future. Anytime you do a study, there are always more questions to be answered. Because one thing leads to another and leads to another. And there are a lot of questions on the table, which I hope will inspire others to pick up this kind of research. Because when I got into this area, I discovered nobody else is working in this area, which is kind of a tough place to start, because you need to build on the work of others, that your contribution just extends knowledge a little bit. And when you can't find a place to put that, it's a little more challenging. So I had to do a little extra work, but I think I finally landed somewhere that is building on the work of others. So I'm going to tell you the story of three different pastors. And these stories are all true. And they contribute in part to how I got to this research. So pastor number one. Earlier this year, the center was contacted by a pastor who was struggling to get his congregation to connect with bioethical issues. And I'm going to call him Pastor Dave. So Pastor Dave has led his current congregation for over 10 years. It's a small church in a rural community in the South. And when he talks to them about bioethics, bioethics issues, he says, quote, they look at me like a horse looking over a fence. That's the response he gets from his congregation. Now, Pastor Dave is not ignorant. He's very well informed. He has followed bioethical issues for years. He took an ethics class in seminary, and he remembers it. He studied the work of Francis Schaeffer and Dr. Koop. In fact, after his wife struggled through um, an ectopic pregnancy and the, the death of their very young child, the doctors treated her very coldly. But it was Edith Schaeffer who gave them comfort and hope. And so they made a powerful impact on this pastor's uh, life as well as his wife's. Dave is a trained pastoral counselor, so he knows how to talk to people about sensitive issues. 
He did clinical training at a major medical center that does organ transplantation, and he was on the transplant allocation team. Doesn't this sound like a dream bioethics pastor? And yet, he said, he struggles with how to help his members resist the moral erosion that's going on around them, especially the older members denying what is happening with the, the younger people in the congregation. They don't engage. Bioethics doesn't even register on their arena of concern. They don't want to talk about end-of-life issues, even though they keep coming up. And here's what they might say. The nursing home is keeping grandma and grandpa alive just so they can get more money. Why don't we put them out of their misery and put them down? just like that horse. Or they will say they're against abortion, but if their daughter gets pregnant, they will take her to get an abortion. And they won't tell anyone about it because keeping up appearances is number one. Maintain the image is number one. So this isn't something that's just Chicago suburbs. This is true of the rural South. So probably 75% of the people in Dave's town say they believe in God. And Dave says that if you were to ask them how many of you live like you believe in God, the number would go down drastically. So we talked at length about this, about what we say and how we live, and that disconnect between what we call theory and practice, or between um, orthodoxy and orthopraxy, between what we believe and what we actually do, and the attitudes we actually have. So my question is, how would you help Pastor Dave? I'll let you sit with that one, because act, that would actually take us in another direction. But we had a conversation for about an hour um, as I was trying to help him just with some sort of fundamental congregational issues to help them care about bioethics. Story number two. Last Friday, Pastor Nathan Babcock posted an essay on our Intersections Forum that he called The Challenge of Bringing Bioethics into Ministry. Now, Intersections is a forum, our, the latest um, initiative at the Center for Bioethics, and it is a forum for conversations about moral questions in medicine and technology, and it's using the language of theology and church ministry. So it's kind of designed to be written by pastors, for pastors, as well as lay leaders and people in the church. So one very practical thing you can do is email your pastor and clue them into the Intersections Forum. It's on our Everyday Bioethics website, and I'll pause here for just a moment. This is the handiest piece of information you're going to get all evening. So if you don't remember anything I say, on the back of this is all of our electronic resources. And the Intersections Forum is on the second one, everydaybioethics.org. There's a tab at the top. So that's just a handy um, resource to check out later. And then also this is the brochure and our summer conference. We can maybe talk about it at the end, but I'm not going to actually be getting into that topic at all right now. So this forum, which is designed to give Christian guidance at the intersections of medicine, technology, and the Christian life, on this forum, Nathan is writing about his frustration. He studied bioethics when he was semin in seminary, not just an ethics class, but actually bioethics. He wrote about it. He organized a seminar about bioethics. He preached a sermon series on bioethics. Well, now he's pastoring a small congregation in Michigan. His interest in bioethics, as he admits, has waned. And he's wrestling with the problem of what he calls the Grand Canyon-sized chasm between the world of the average evangelical congregation and the world of the Christian Academy. You are all now part of the Christian Academy, sitting here um, in a classroom at Trinity. So he identifies two problems. First, evangelical congregations aren't able to do biblical, theological, and ethical thinking. That's really a sad statement, that people in the pew can't do biblical thinking or theological thinking or ethical thinking. And secondly, the bioethics discourse, the academic bioethics conversation, happens at a level that is unintelligible to the average churchgoer. So how do you connect the level of conversation you're having here or the level of conversation that you're at least interacting with in the textbooks, how do you connect that with the everyday real life problems that people are having um, people that are sitting in the pew that they're wrestling with and they don't even know how to articulate it or they may not even be aware that there's any ethical problem. They may just think it's financial um, or medical. So how would you help Pastor Nathan if he came to you for advice? Again, very well equipped. He's tried this and now he's losing interest. And he doesn't see how the, ac the academic work that he has done is connecting with his congregational ministry. 
All right, one more story. This is Pastor James. So I attend a church that has several pastors, and I've interacted with some of them on bioethics issues. So I'm actually going to use Pastor James as a composite. All this is true, but instead of identifying each pastor, I'm putting them all into the bucket of Pastor James. So he's comfortable with giving wise guidance and handling pastoral counseling. He's invited me to present as the expert at different times on abortion, on end-of-life issues, on fetal tissue procurement, on thinking Christianly about bioethics, and these were all in adult education classes. I have walked through the medical and ethical aspects of IVF for ministry residents and new pastors. Now, the congregation, at least those who attended, I think is better informed, or at least I hope they're better informed after sitting through at least one of those classes. And some of them have talked to me after a presentation saying it actually came up in a conversation they had the very next week or a decision that they had to make about, um, in many cases, this end-of-life care. That's where most of the questions arise, is um, how do we care for grandma and grandpa? Can we pull the plug? What do we do about DNR orders, ventilators, those kinds of questions? Some of them have asked me about current biotechnology issues months after the presentation, which tells me it's now on their radar. Because you know, once you've started paying attention to bioethics issues, you will see them everywhere. And one of the most fun places to spot them is on your screen whether it's you know, a Netflix series or you're watching you know, a movie or a network broadcast, you'll find bioethics themes interwoven throughout. And they're, they're really great vehicles for entering into a conversation with someone else at a very low risk when you're just kind of talking about a show. In fact, there's one, the, one woman who was introduced to me said, oh, you're the ethics lady. So that's now my reputation. Um, but at least my church is, is um, being intentional about giving a space to people who have thought about these issues more carefully. So here's how Pastor James thinks about educating and equipping his congregation, and this is a quote. We need to help our people understand these issues and ask these questions. I'm not sure that outside of the counseling chamber, so to speak, pastors are engaging these issues or engaging their congregations at this level. And he went on to say, in this church, we have some really fine doctors who actually integrate what they believe with how they practice. I can't imagine that's the common experience. And James has said that he wouldn't send people to just any doctor to get ethical advice about a medical procedure. But he wouldn't assume that these doctors have a solid biblical and ethical foundation for giving moral advice. And that's really important. In talking to a doctor, you want, kind of want to know what is their ethical perspective, what's their framework on these decisions. So how many of your churches have somebody like a Pastor James? Anybody have a Pastor James type pastor? Oh, there's so much opportunity here. <laughs> Not a single hand went up. All right. Well, these three evangelical pastors represent a spectrum. And the spectrum ranges from sort of the uninterested and uninvolved to being aware and intentional. Now, some pastors are simply unaware. Some are interested and supportive, but they will never preach about it and there are various reasons why pastors won't preach about it. They might invite people with expertise to address it in classes, which is what I have done. Um, others are active in their parishioners' lives, and they will ask direct questions. So here's what one pastor who makes home visits to his congregation, can you imagine? Pastors still making home visits. He's, he'll say, have you made your funeral service plans? So he's talking to an elderly person and just confronting her. Have you made your funeral service plans? And then the next question is, did you sign an advanced directive? And so he'll walk her through it. So a few will tackle, and a few pastors will tackle these issues from the pulpit. And that way they can reach the entire congregation. That's really the only time you reach the entire congregation. So if the pastor makes a decision that this is not a topic for the pulpit or cannot be used as a sermon illustration, you are likely not going to reach your congregation with even a lowest level of awareness of these issues. So any ideas on how we can help these pastors? Now, you're not looking at me like a horse looking over a fence, but uh, I see, oh, she's, don't call on me, don't call on me. I won't call on anybody. <laughs> I'm going to ask you something you can answer. Let's, let's see where pastors are. Is your pastor not engaged? Does he talk about the issues? Is he able to counsel, teach, preach, or actively engaged? So let's just start at the highest level of commitment. How many of you think your pastor is actively engaged on these issues? Okay. How many have heard anything in a sermon that relates to these issues? I'm seeing one hand, two hands go up. How about teaching, maybe like in a Sunday adult class? Another couple hands go up. 
Counseling you may or may not know, so something they would handle privately. A few more, the pastor does counseling. Talks about these issues, not necessarily in the pulpit, but just in general. Not engaged. Okay, so there are, there are only a few that say completely not engaged. So this is good. If they're completely unengaged, then you've got a bigger challenge, and where do I start? So this is the problem I wanted to unpack. What influences pastors to become interested in bioethical issues and eventually to become bioethical moral leaders in their congregation and even beyond? So there it is. It's a little stretch. We couldn't get that worked out. Um, thanks, th thanks to just the challenge, challenge this, challenges of technology. But that's kind of what the cover page of a dissertation looks like. What I, um, def what's called a defense, what I defended uh, last February 28th. So you have this very kind of wordy title. And they're not exciting, but they're necessary. So becoming bioethically confident, the contribution of formal and non-formal learning experiences to evangelical pastors' congregational moral leadership. So is what formed these pastors to care? And I, I wondered if it was the kind of family they grew up in. Was it an early experience with death? Was it having a sibling with a disability? Well, the good news is, is that there is no single path. It was sort of all the above. Some of them had a terrible seminary experience and yet still became quite um, competent as leaders on bioethics. So there's good news. There is no single path for a pastor to care about these issues. So let me give a brief introduction to the research. When I set out to do the research, I had th sort of three basic motivations. One was my own experience. I'd spent many years in the pro-life movement and got to the point where I realized that I wasn't equipped to talk about some of these new technologies when the uh, human stem cells, human embryonic stem cells were isolated in 1998 and, and when cloning was becoming a possibility. And then you have robotic technologies and you have the computer brain interface. It's like, ah, I don't know how to think about these, which is why I, I got my master's in bioethics here at Trinity. So I didn't feel equipped to talk about these issues even though I was a trained professional. I already had my law degree. I had been teaching um, at a college um, as an adjunct, but I didn't want to talk about these issues. So people say, well, you're smart. No, and no, it's not about that at all. It's just I didn't know about these issues. So I had kind of a personal experience on how I came to care about it. Then I have a professional interest now as the director of the center. I really want to help people make better decisions. It's not just so that, that people think the right thoughts. That's not the point. The point is so that we can live faithful Christian lives in light of what we believe and know about God and the world that he has made. So we're, we're not trying to just you know, get people to say the right things, but to have the right impulses to make good decisions, and decisions that honor and respect one another and our bodies and the creation that God has made. And then I also have a motivation as an educational researcher and learning how to be a researcher. And in theological education, as in so many other areas of education, there is a struggle to close the gap between what we call theory and practice. It's like, how do I connect what I'm learning in the classroom with what happens out there in everyday life? How does what I learn here translate into what I'm going to encounter as a professional? So for example, the, the professional therapist learns all these theories of counseling and how you listen and how you respond and so on. But until that therapist actually has hundreds and hundreds of hours of practice and engaging and listening, they aren't going to really have a sense of quite what to do and to have it not going through a checklist in their mind, but how to be a counselor, how to be a therapist. And we'll t talk about that a little bit when we get into the models that I um, developed. So my hopes were that I would find enough participants. And yes, I did. I found my 25 pastors. None of them were quite as expert as I had anticipated. I really thought that there was this dream pastor who knew everything that was needed for bioethics, had this congregation that was engaged and asking questions. And you know what? That is an ideal. It's a composite of probably a number of different pastors and members of congregations. Um, I hope to find out about the impact of theological education. Does seminary help pastors? Is it neutral? Does it actually hurt them in becoming moral leaders in bioethical issues? And, and so as I said at the beginning, I wanted to find out the factors that helped them and contributed to their growth. I wanted to find insights for theological educators 
so that they can do a better job of preparing pastors without overburdening the curriculum. That's always a challenge. Everybody thinks, I've got this great new course. Everybody should have this course, but your requirements are already up to here, and you just can't have any more requirements. But we, every one of us thinks our course is the best, or we wouldn't be so committed to teaching it. We have to, you have to love what you teach. And so you think, this is a great course. Everybody should want to be here. Right, John? <laughs> um, and I hoped that evangelical theologians would take up the challenge to reflect more deeply on these questions. Because there are some practical everyday questions where evangelical theologians haven't really done the hard work of thinking theologically about them, not just bioethically, but theologically. Because as, as Christians, that's where we want to begin. And then the ethical reflection flows out of that. So I decided that the best place to begin was to listen to pastors who were already interested, who already had some level of confidence, and find out what triggered that interest. Well, every study has to have a purpose. And so the purpose of the study was to discover what factors contributed to pastors becoming bioethically confident leaders of their congregation. So this doesn't speak to their competence level. It might be assessed objectively. But how confident do they feel about issues that might come their way? Because some of the pastors said, yeah, pretty much anything that comes through the door, I think I can handle it. And if I don't know the answer, I know how to get an answer. I know where to go. And that's a, a really key finding. So I interviewed 25 evangelical pastors. They were mostly from the Midwest. And I ended up with only male pastors. So this is one of those few dissertations where I actually did use he and his throughout instead of the sort of the he, she, or the they uh, rubric because I, I couldn't get any women who were evangelical pastors with experience. Some of them were chaplains, but they didn't have congregational experience. So I'm hoping for a future study we can see women's experience in leading um, on bioethical issues. I did one-hour interviews. Now, some of them we just couldn't wrap it up in an hour. Pastors, as you know, are able to speak for more than three minutes. Then you analyze the transcript. So you transcribe every interview. I did about the first 10 myself, which takes a long time, but it's really important to do that. And then I used a paid transcriptionist for the rest. You analyze them at several levels. and I won't go through all those levels, but you become very familiar with what these pastors said. And I gave them each a name instead of a number. You can give them code numbers, but they have to be anonymized. So they have to be anonymous for the pastor. So I just used the letters of the alphabet. So Alex was my first one. Zachary's my next to last one. I got one more, but I hadn't used X, so that's Xander. <laughs> I used every letter but U, and it just helped me uh, connect with them and, and it helped them stay alive in my mind. So as you're doing this analysis, you're looking for patterns and themes. What are they saying? What am I hearing? Not what am I looking for, but what is there? There's, it, is, it is subjective in that I am, as the researcher, I actually am an instrument of the study. This is not an objective arm's length study where you're just counting numbers. So that, I make that very clear in how I discuss my data. Then all of that is worked into what's called a five-chapter dissertation. It's kind of the classic dissertation in my field. First chapter is the introduction to the study. That's actually your shortest chapter. Chapter two, this is the killer. It's called the literature review. Have any of you had ever heard of a literature review or come across any literature review studies in your studies? This is where you talk about all the other scholars that have gone before. It's called building your theory base. And so you have to have theory for what comes out in later chapters. And if, you, if this is just going over your head, don't worry about it. But it's basically saying, we always stand on someone else's shoulders. We're always building on previously gained knowledge. In other words, you can't, it, the saying is true, you didn't create that knowledge. It, you're part of a community of scholars who created it. So that's your literature review. It's saying, yeah, I know what I'm doing, and there's solid foundation for making these kinds of observations and conclusions about my data. Then chapter three is the methodology. That's where you describe the mechanics of the research, what you did, what you actually, what you intended to do, what you actually did, that you complied with all the um, ethical guidelines, that you did ethical research. Chapter four is the findings. This is just a summary of what they actually said. And so that's a, a fairly um, straightforward process. Not that it's easy, but it's straightforward. It's like you're not interjecting your interpretation in chapter four. And then finally, when you are exhausted and tired and all you want to do is be done, is the hard work of what did you see? What did you observe, the, the findings? And you have to bring the energy to that because that's where you're making your contribution. Up to that point, you haven't really made a significant contribution. It's the chapter five that makes all the difference. So, you know, 252 pages and 65,000 words later, it was done. Now, this is the copy I had at my hearing, which is why I have it all tabbed and so on. But that is a dissertation.
Now, some of you may do a master's thesis and you'll say, oh, thank goodness, I never have to go there. <laughs> and I didn't do it till quite late in life, but it can, it can be done. It's an endless process. So let's talk about the evangelical pastors that I interviewed. Now, you're going to notice that these are not representative of the whole country. Um, and that's okay with qualitative research. This is not quantitative. This is not what you call generalizable. You can't take this and say this is true of all pastors. This is only true of the 25 pastors I talked to. So a future study might be to say, well, how characteristic is this of all evangelical pastors and figure out a way to do a quantitative study to actually figure that out. So you can see that there's a pretty good representation of seminaries with overrepresentation of TEDs, um, which isn't surprising because that they, being here in this community, this is partly how I started building my um, database of participants. There are two that are considered um, more, actually three that are considered more liberal and each participant's experience with a more liberal seminary was kind of interesting. And then the states represented primarily the Midwest. Uh, some of these I drove to and did in person. But then we started getting to Florida, Connecticut, um, North Carolina, Tennessee. I wasn't driving there, so we did those by Skype, or two by, and two of those were by telephone. All right, the location of the church, mostly suburban, but we had representation of all the other um, locations, rural, small town, small city, large city, inner city. And I don't know if you can see these numbers, but the size of the congregation, uh, four of them were between, the smallest congregation was 90, the largest was 5,000. So we had four, they were between 90 to 150, eight and was the most common number with either two, between 200 and 250 or between one to 2,000. And then there were two at the 450 to 500 range and three above 3,500. So that's, it, it's helpful because you get to talk to a pastor who's on a staff or a pastor who's in charge of the whole congregation. And how they relate to people is reflected in just their awareness of their congregation. And then finally, the denominations represented. Um, the largest number was non-denominational. That was seven. And then four each of Baptist. And this included, this is not just Southern Baptists. Um, so Baptist, uh, four Free Church, four Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, um, and four Presbyterian, and then one each of Dutch Reformed and Evangelical Mennonite. Any questions? Just got, kind of giving you a quick overview. So as I looked at the data, I had three educational strands that I was focusing on. And data can be in, analyzed in a variety of ways. This is what I did. And I could go back to the data and be looking for other, um, have other goals in mind. But I, I had so much data, I couldn't do all that. I just had to focus in on certain pieces. So one was the strand of the adult learner and lifelong learning, because everyone who's in seminary is already an adult learner. You know, they're out of the undergraduate residential 18 to 22 year old program. So they're considered adult learners. And there are different theories that support adult learning. But you don't want just an adult learner. You want somebody who is a lifelong learner. That actually is the goal of your education here at Trinity. It's actually not to stuff your minds full of information. It's to turn you into knowledge sponges, that for the rest of your life you'll be hungry for knowledge about this incredible world that you live in. And, you know, and if you graduate and you think, I'm never going to open another book, or I'm never going to click on another article on my phone, whatever it is, then you know, we have failed you. If you end up hating learning when you leave here, then you should get your money back. Or there's something else going on. I'm not offering a refund, but I'm just saying that's part of it, is lifelong learning. Secondly, is the contribution of theological schools to pastoral formation. And that's not just what goes into the head, but how are they formed in their identity as a pastor and how they understand themselves as a pastor. And then third, the preparation of the pastor as a professional. And the clergy was traditionally seen as one of the three professions. Anybody know what the other two professions were historically? Now everybody's a professional. Medicine? Teaching? No, not teaching. Legal. Law. Oh. Yeah. So it was theology, medicine, and law were the three professions because of what to profess means. There's, it's, it's more now than, than we have professionals for every, almost everything. You know, you can have an animal welfare professional and they simply work at the veterinary clinic. So, but preparing the pastor as a professional, and there's a lot that's entailed with that. So here are some things I learned about the pastors. Probably none of these will surprise you, but they might encourage you. First of all, they really care about their congregation. They care very deeply. And you may not suspect it when you listen to your pastor, and you may feel very disconnected from him, but he cares about you. 
uh, the Lilly Foundation commissioned a congregational study and they said, here's what people want to know. And you can see, is this how you think about your pastor? They want to know that it's a pastor that you love God and that you love them. And then thirdly, they also kind of want to know that you're competent to do what you're doing. But if you don't love God and don't love them, it doesn't matter if you're competent. Secondly, they pray. And sometimes when they don't know what to do for you, they'll pray. Third, they value relationships and especially mentors. And this would be a whole other study. There was so much I learned about mentorship. Many of them have had strong mentors. A number of them have come to the place where they realize that they're now called to be mentors to others. They experience, excuse me, they display empathy. Um, that's listening well, asking good questions, being able to be present with people. And some of them, the way they talked about being present with someone. For example, how many of you have gone to a wake? I mean, at a funeral. And did you know what to say to the person, the family member of the person who had died? You kind of struggle with that. So when Pastor was saying, he talks to the family before the funeral. He says, look, people are going to come in. They're going to come through the line. And some of them are going to say some really dumb things. Like if it's an infant funeral, they're going to say, God just needed another angel in heaven. That's a dumb thing to say. You know, so they said just people don't know what to say, but they want to say something to express concern. They just want to be present and just accept that they were present to express their sympathy. And families have said that's so helpful. Just, so that's that part of empathy is just being present, that your being there is more important than what comes out of your mouth. They, um, they value the... Um, Pursuing, excuse me, they pursue continuing education, back to that lifelong learning thing. And they are learners, and they know where to go, and they use a variety of resources. There is no magic resource to reach pastors. We were really hoping at the center that it would tell us, just have one terrific website. But there's some pastors who read books, and there's some who read blogs, and there's some who listen to podcasts. They don't all get their resources the same way, just like probably most of you get your information from more than one source, I hope. And then here's a term that you need to kind of write down because you want to use this next time you talk to your parents. Epistemic humility. Epistemic humility, what does that say to you? You probably get the humility part, right? But how about epistemic? You know what epistemic humility is? Well, epistemology is the study of what we know and how we know it. So epistemic humility is humility about your knowledge it's humility that says, I know what I don't know. I'm willing to admit when I don't know. But it's also saying, and I know where to go to get help. What else did I find? I found that pastors need help. So let me tell you about Derek. He's the pastor of a rapidly growing church in a small city in central Illinois. He learned that in his church, this is central Illinois, you wouldn't think that this would be a problem. 62 couples in his church are struggling with infertility. And he showed me a stack of index cards, one for each family, this high. And he was just in tears as he was telling me about this. They're dealing with infertility. Some of them successfully, 13 families in the church have twins. Their nursery is just kind of a twins explosion. There may be reasons related to assisted reproduction that account for that. Uh, the story that he struggled with, he said there was a woman who had ovarian disease. So she knew when she, and this was when she was younger, she knew when she got married she would not be able to have children. And so she told her husband, and they were perfect, they were settled with that. He was okay with it, she was okay with it. 20 years after they got married, the urge to have a baby just overcame them. Well, she no longer had ovaries, so they had to procure eggs from somewhere else, and she couldn't carry pregnancy to term, so they got a gestational surrogate. So here, this couple who is older, past childbearing age, are declaring to the church that they're pregnant. She's not visibly pregnant. But the church shows it, th throws this baby shower for this woman who, low in her old age, is now going to have a child. And there was this big celebration. And Derek said to me, he says, Paige, you know, I just don't know if we did it right. We celebrate new life. We care for the family. But did we do it right? He said, where does modern technology bump up against ancient morality? The answer is everywhere. And Xander, the last one I interviewed, who's an experienced pastor, said it, he just put it very bluntly. He said, if pastors aren't asking these bioethical questions, excuse me, aren't facing these bioethical issues, they are burying their heads in the sand. Now let me tell you about a pastor who maybe his head was buried in the sand, but God got it out of the sand. You know, when I presented this at a church 
a few weeks ago, I said, how many people have heard of Christianity Today? And only the pastor and the assistant pastor had heard of it. This was a church of brand new Christians. This was not what they read. I won't ask you if you've heard of Christianity Today, but let me just tell you, it is a significant journal of evangelical thought, and it's very reflective. So we'll let it go at that. So in the current issue, the March issue, there is this article, In the Image of Our Choosing, you see it up there, by a, man, a pastor named Nathan Barzi. Well, uh, George Church, who is the leading expert in CRISPR, have we encountered CRISPR yet? Yes? Okay. Clustered randomly, interspaced, uh, whatever. Um, so he is the leading expert in CRISPR. His wife is named Ting Wu. She's a Harvard geneticist. And they wanted to have a conversation about the ethical issues of using CRISPR in human beings and human embryos. And they wanted it to happen in communities of faith. So what Wu did is she started calling churches in the phone book. And the pastors at Christ the King Church were the first ones to answer the phone. And that's where Nathan Barzi is on staff, is at Christ the King. This is in the Harvard area. So he talks about the series of conversations that this raised and how it led him to do more searching. You know, and he said, our church hosted Wu, who claims no particular religious affiliation, for a series of conversations about the state of the technology and the ethical questions it raises. Her description of the pace at which the technology is advancing left me convinced that as a pastor, I needed to understand the science and the ethical questions much more deeply. So it's not just ethics, it's the science. We need in churches to care about basic science literacy. So that doesn't happen for most pastors. So the question is, how can we inspire pastors to care about these issues and to find the resources they need? Well, back to the research. So in qualitative research, it's a good practice to, practice to look for the simplest explanation. And one way is using a verb to describe what is emerging. And believe me, I went through so many drawings and sketches and so on trying to come to this. But the word that emerged for me is the word becoming. Because I, ident I, ident I identified that as reflecting three phases in a pastor's develop in development in seminary, in the congregation, and then those who actually become what I would call accomplished pastors who lead outside the congregation. So let me describe for you now the phases of becoming and these visual models that I developed to describe it. So this is the culture of seminary. So whatever kind of seminary the pastor goes to is going to influence, the circles are, are places where um, interactions happen. So this is the, the conversations, experiences, personal interests, what happens in the curriculum at the seminary. Some pastors are either second career, so they come with that experience. They get field education, an internship, or a pastorate, which means they're actually getting to practice some of the things they're learning in the classroom while they are still in seminary. These arrows that bounce off, things that detract from the pastor to develop. So don't worry too much about understanding this model. And if you didn't have my explanation, it's just gibber gibberish. But each part of it actually makes sense. But what I wanted to point out for, for you is two things. One, oh, it's going to be three. Exploration is the process of becoming aware. That's becoming aware of the bioethical issues. This could be used maybe to describe other things the pastor is becoming aware of, but I'm focusing on bioethics. And at my hearing, we decided the pastoral care model really is better labeled the apprenticed bioethical leadership paradigm. And don't worry about that. But this is part of scholarship at work is you refine it and you make it better. But in that path of becoming aware, it's kind of winding and sometimes he may even feel like he's going backwards. And that's what's happening when you're learning something new. And this is the time when he's very focused on knowing. Have you heard of the know, be, do aspects of human development? Well, we're going to get through know, be, do. So this is heavy, heavy on knowing, on learning, just absorbing as much Greek and Hebrew and theology and church history as the pastor can stand. So and maybe you can't, but you've got to pass to get your MDiv. So this was an exploration phase. Those who had this other experience, either second career or experience outside the church, did a lot better in making those connections because they got to do it immediately while they're in school. Phase two is proficiency and becoming confident. So this is practiced bioethical leadership. So these are kind of two sides of preaching, teaching, and counseling. And let me just say that what you see here is the arrow is smoothing out. It's not quite so turbulent, but it's, see how busy this is? A pastor starting out in congregational ministry is just overwhelmed with all the activity. I mean, they've come from seminary where they have classes where they sit around and they discuss one verse for 45 minutes. 
they get to a congregation, they don't care about that one verse for 45 minutes. They want to know, it's like, my, my kid has run away from home. What do I do? And it's, for some pastors, they're just overwhelmed with all the, the tasks and challenges of ministry. But despite that, and men, in, in some cases after maybe five years or so, things tr start to settle down and you see more of a flow between the preaching, teaching, counseling, the congregational culture, and the kinds of um, ongoing learning, that's what these little green diamonds are, learning opportunities and relationships, a mentoring relationship. So, and this is where most pastors I interviewed ended up. They're confident. Originally I called them competent, but we decided that they're not, that's kind of an objective assessment. And some of them are more confident than competent, but I'd rather have them confident so that they're willing to engage. And then finally, there are a handful, just like in every other area of life, there are a handful who sort of rise above. You might call them outliers or positive deviants, D-E-V-I-A-N-T-S, but not in the negative sense of a deviant, but they're different because they kind of rise above the rest. And these are leaders who have entered this phase of mastery or becoming accomplished. So they have a healthy relationship with their church. They are uh, exhibiting wisdom, courage, and trust, and we can maybe come back to that. But what you see here is that they are going beyond the congregation to mentor others to influence their denomination. Some of them were challenging their denominations to change or update position statements. The public, one had a radio program, and he said he did more ethics on his radio program than in his church, teaching and speaking, writing. Some acknowledged other leaders in these areas, and so we're speaking of them as this. They weren't a phase three pastor, but they were grateful for those who were and also influencing other pastors. One of the most helpful things is the pastors who were in relationships with other pastors, either weekly or monthly, and kind of maybe a mutual mentorship, because they get outside the congregation and they can talk and be real and talk about how hard it is in their congregation. Or what do I do when I'm in the county that has the highest rate of heroin addiction in the US? That's one of my pastors. Um, they don't, and another one, he says, we don't have abortions because in my county, nobody who gets pregnant is going to give birth. In another church, the, the issue um, is the pastor has a congregation full of people who work in um, very high-tech medical centers, and so they have different challenges. So every pastor has their own situation, but some of them are um, in good relationships with other pastors, and that's a really helpful thing. So maybe what your pastor needs is another pastor. These pastors who are accomplished have high trust. Their congregation trusts them implicitly, and some of them can establish trust with a new congregation very quickly. They embody wisdom, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But one of the most intriguing characteristics is courage, because they said that's what makes a difference, is you have to have courage to take a stand on some of these issues. I mean, it's, it's OK to talk about um, human trafficking, it's okay to talk about HIV AIDS, but some of these other issues you don't dare talk about them because they are not popular in the culture. They're not acceptable. You have to, as one pastor said, you have to be willing to lose some people in order to save some people. And you have to be willing to let some of your high tithers walk out the door because they're offended by your sermon or by your position. So courage is, I think, one of the most significant keys in becoming that kind of pastor. But embodying wisdom, there is professional literature about the professional who embodies wisdom, and some of this comes from the nursing literature. You think about an expert nurse who you know, has done, done it for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. I think of my cousin who is um, about 40 years in nursing, 35 years in nursing. When that nurse walks into the room, she doesn't think, okay, first I have to check blood pressure and then temperature and then look into the eyes. She can look at the patient and assess what's going on and say, this patient is dying, and tell the doctor, and, sh and can assess it actually better than the doctor, or can say, we really need to get some blood pressure medication here. This patient's blood pressure is low without even taking it, or before taking it. So that kind of embodied wisdom, it comes out of living a lot of life, making a lot of mistakes, learning from those mistakes, being willing to get up and learn again. And, but it's not just professional literature that speaks of embodied wisdom. It's also the theological literature. And Dr. Kevin Van Hooser, who teaches here at TEDS, in his book, The Drama of Doctrine, writes, the mind of Christ refers not merely to Jesus' intellectual quotient or his stock of knowledge, but to his habitus, a Latin word, which he then explains, the distinctive pattern of all his intentional acts, his desires, remember I talked about internal transformation, hopes, 
beliefs, volitions, emotions, as well as thoughts, the embodied wisdom of God. And this is not something that is for pastors alone. This kind of embodied wisdom uh, should be the, the desire and pursuit of every Christian. You know, if, you, if, you, if the Lord gives you enough years on this earth where you can live long enough to embody wisdom, that can be the most wonderful thing to, um, most wonderful way to be described is you know, he embodies wisdom or she embodies wisdom. So I made some recommendations for theological education. One is to require attention to ethics in the curriculum, at least ethics. If you can't do bioethics, at least ethics, but ethics should include bioethics because what is not in the curriculum, the required curriculum, is what we call the null curriculum. It's telling you what is absent is unimportant. So what is present is what this seminary has decided is important for you to learn. The second recommendation is that they have a biblical and theological foundation for a rapidly changing world. So uh, many of the pastors agree, don't teach me the issues. Don't te teach, teach me what is the answer on this issue because the next technology is going to come along and I won't know what to do because I won't know what the answer is. You know, you can't plug answer A into box B if you've got now technology K. So what's the foundation for thinking through the issues, which means thinking through the questions? And so when you graduate from this program, you should have a pretty good sense of how to think through the questions, and as a Christian, how to think through biblically and theologically. Thirdly, help the form, helping to form the pastor as a lifelong learner with an adequate, now the pastoral care model was the word I used in my dissertation, it would now be the bioethical paradigm. To have an adequate model for how do you deal with bioethics, because these other recommendations flow beyond bioethics. But when it comes to bioethics, you've got to have a paradigm that works for bioethics. And then fourth, and this is so important, to help connect theory with practice and find uh, pedagogical or teaching uh, methods that can help that happen in the classroom or during seminary as much as possible. Um, my dissertation director described it as a bioethics tornado drill. Um, one of the pastors said, give him live ammo. And so he'd come in and say, okay, um, write me a paragraph on this situation. Or he would say, I want a sermon on this by next week. So, or just somehow mimicking the stress of a bioethical situation. Because, you know, usually these are very stressful situations for the people who are making the decision. And that stress then can sort of absorb, the pastor can absorb that stress, and he may have to make a decision quickly, but he has to know how to slow things down and take time to, to develop a good answer. But you've got to put them under pressure. And I bet if I started asking each of you these questions and how you would answer them, you'd probably get nervous if you thought I was going to do that right now. <coughs> yeah, everybody's going to like look down, look away. You know, if she doesn't get, if she doesn't get my eyes, she won't call on me. But helping that happen during seminary where it's safe, where you're supported, where it's okay to make mistakes. In fact, that's the best time to make mistakes because how many of you remember more of your mistakes and learning from those than from all the things you did right? Those things tend to kind of stick with you. I still remember a mistake I made on a chemistry test in eighth grade. <laughs> But I now know the difference between a physical change and a chemical change when it comes to a straw Panama hat. So I learned from that. All right. So questions for future research. I'll just run through these real quickly because I want to make sure we have some time for interaction. Here are some of the things that I wondered about. How about pastors who don't have an MDiv? And there's one community in particular where most of the pastors do not have a Master of Divinity, and that's the African American Church. And um, I interviewed uh, an African-American pastor who encountered more bioethical issues than I think almost any other pastor, learning in the, down in the trenches, if you will. Female pastors and chaplains that I mentioned earlier. How to care for healthcare professionals in the congregation as the ability to be an ethical nurse or doctor or physician assistant is or pharmacist is becoming more and more difficult under the um, regulatory regimes that uh, we've encountered over the last um, 15 to 20 years. So here's what I'm going to come back into, is to investigate why the congregation does or does not get, consult their pastor. And ask people in the pew what is their perspective, because it might be different than their pastors. The pastor might think that he's doing a good job, that people are coming to him and talking to him, and people might really be just totally avoiding him. And does the size or demographic of the congregation matter? You know, I had a variety, but I can't tell you that size matters. And I can't tell you if a particular demographic matters. One pastor 
who was um, an accomplished pastor, you know, who embodied wisdom. His, he was uh, the second youngest person in his congregation. Most of them were over 70 and 80. It's just because it was a kind of retirement community. So what do you think his number one bioethical issue is? End of life concerns. I mean, he's just every day he was doing like five, ten funerals a year. So, um, so there's a lot of counseling that needs to be done there. And then to compare, when did pastors go to seminary? Because that says a lot about what you were taught. Pastors who went in the 70s, it was abortion was the issue, and the battle for the Bible was a theological concern. That's not true of pastors who are younger. They're getting more of these issues during their education. What is the ethical framework they use? I have a lot of data on that. Couldn't analyze it um, in this study. But how are they actually working through these questions? Some of them are not doing, it's actually kind of from the, just sort of shooting from the hip and they might get a good response and some of them is like, <gasps> because you're the interviewer, you don't respond to what they're saying, but I'm thinking, oh, there's trouble here. <laughs> um, I like to know more about the preaching and teaching about bioethics, why some pastors are resistant. Some said, well, we only preach the gospel and bioethics isn't the gospel. Another one said, it's always, the sermon's always about Jesus Christ and that's not bio, bioethics. I had other pastors who said it's in scripture, it's everywhere. So there's, that would be a very interesting study. Um, one pastor, Paul, said, I think one of the things that they didn't teach me well is that your content needs to be less and your application needs to be more. You know how hard that is for professors. We just want to give you all the content because we think it's so important for you to know this. We need to give you chances to do the application or help you see the connections. And he went to a, what's called a training in place seminary where you're in your congregation doing seminary. You don't leave your pastorate. And even with that, he felt like he still needed more, con more application and less content. And then how can seminaries be better ongoing resources for pastors? Because sometimes in seminary, you don't know what you're going to need. So we can't tell you you're going to need this. We can alert you that these issues will come up. Then it's when you're in the congregation, it's like, oh, my goodness, I need help. Some people go back to their notes from seminary. Some go back to professors they have relationships with. Some go back to their books. But they're all going back to seminary in some way. How can seminaries be an ongoing resource for that? A study on the value of mentorship. That was a real rich part of the conversation. And, the, and here was an interesting one. The impact of mentors on younger or newer pastors. As one of the older pastors said, millennials are resistant to mentorship because they think, I know everything because I can Google it. And that's kind of scary when I think about pastors who think they've got it down because they can Google it. I don't actually want to Google it pastor. I want a pastor who's in relationships with other human beings and doing the hard work of character formation and mental formation, but they're diff you know, so that'd be another interest whole interesting kind of study. So here's the question. Why is it so hard to interest a church in bioethics? And now this is your chance to just, any ideas you have, any thoughts that come to mind? Over here, yeah. or uh, the reality of maybe facing some of these issues later along in life. The, so who's failing? Is it the, uh, church, the pastor or the congregation? The congregation, the congregation not looking at these issues. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. People want to keep these issues private. Keep it private. They don't want to share it. We don't, and why do you think they might not want to share it? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection, okay. Judgment. Judgment. Those are very powerful. Yeah. Any other thoughts on why? Back here. I think a lot of people shy away from these things because they, um, they might go in the category of being perceived as personal. But about the most intolerable thing to do is to speak against something that someone else has done. And so, they don't so wanna... we just stay quiet about it so as to not offend someone how could you say that what I did was wrong? So we're afraid of offending. Yeah, and so we avoid the whole subject, and then, but then that whole subject is ignorant of a biblical approach. So we just we avoid it, and that, and then we, we become even more ignorant. So, and anybody who preaches about you know either abortion or discusses some of the um, aspects of IVF has to know that it affects people that they're talking to, and so there are ways to do that very sensitively say I'm talking about some hard things but you know it's important for you to understand this and, and how you help people who've already made bad decisions that they can't recover from so that's a really good point another comment scared that they have the wrong answer, wrong answer. Really, it's dicey you know maybe we can say no to abortion but then some other issues are 
a little grayer, IVF, things like that. So Not so black and white. What if I don't have the right answer? So that fear of being wrong. So is it the fear of being wrong or is it the desire to be right, do you think? I think a combo, but probably well, a desire to be right. More okay. Like. And it's, that's a good desire, to want to be right. I mean, we want to get to good ethical right. decisions. Oh, yeah. So it's like, where can there be a place to do that kind of exploration of the issues and saying, okay, what about this, where we're not going to attack each other. You know, it's so easy to get into this, arguing somebody into believing what's right. Well, you, we are never argued into belief. None of us was ever argued into belief about God. We were drawn by his irresistible wooing and by maybe the, the, the person, the behavior, the character of others, not by them convincing you with an, with an argument. So we want places where we can do that hard work and gain some confidence in that. Another comment? I think with some, um, they've had so little ethical training that they don't even know it's an issue. They and they're so, <laughs> they're so just influenced by our culture and what is seen as right and wrong that they haven't even been challenged by that in yeah. the church before. So they don't even bring it up because they don't. It's not an issue. issue. If, if anything, it would be, can I afford it? You know, and what are the risks of the technology, perhaps? But very common. Yes, in the back. To piggyback off that comment, I think the church is mirroring the culture in a lot of ways in what we choose to talk about. So at least in the evangelical circles I've been in, abortion is a pretty openly discussed topic, just like it is in the culture. But some of these other things like IVF, end-of-life issues, aren't as openly talked about in the culture and the media, whereas abortion gets a lot more attention. So it's almost like we're reacting instead of being proactive. Even though these things are issues, they're just more under the table. So we kind of just accept the cultural Yeah, terms name of the on discussion, that. yeah. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, yeah. Well, we've learned in our church over the past couple of years, we were doing church. We weren't being the church. Mm. And um, once you understand what being the church is, I think you'd be more open to discussing these kinds of issues. So being the church versus doing the church. And some of these, you see, these aren't really bioethical issues. Almost every one of these is not really a bioethical issue. It's a more foundational issue than that, which says we've got some, I think there's some cracks in our foundations, perhaps. Another uh, observation. It's not exactly in the church, but in my context at a hospital, when you do the advanced directive, it's their acknowledgement that they may die. Especially end-of-life questions. End of life, it's like discussions yeah. of mortality and confronting mortality. Yeah. And um, I don't know how many of you are in a, in a multicultural congregation, but in some cultures that is actually offensive to ask somebody about that because it's like wishing for their death to say you need to do an advanced directive. And so there may, in some churches, that may be a factor. I don't know. I haven't encountered that. <coughs> But certainly in your setting, you may find it with different patients that you're engaging with. Other thoughts or comments on this? You see, you see the size of the problem that I'm interested in? <laughs> so, and I really appreciate that you're all thinking about this and, and you've identified some very um, important and confirmatory kinds of things. So let me just talk about one aspect of, the, uh, aspect of why um, people don't care. because. I think each one of these could be a whole nother conversation. Maybe in our after conversation, we can dig into those a little deeper. Um, and that is the, the, the response of the congregation themselves, the people in the pew. I'll even call them members, but it doesn't mean you have to be a formal member, but people who are attending the church and identify with the local body. Um, and that is, this, it's an idea called congregational imagination or ecclesial imagination. Um, Craig Dykstra described this as the people's engagement in the mission of the church, being the church, rather than just doing churchy things. And he links it, and I'm not going to unpack this very much, but he links it with pastoral imagination. And pastoral imagination is one way of describing that process of how the pastor becomes a pastor in his identity, how he connects the theory of seminary with the practice of the congregation, and how he is kind of figuring out how to do things so that he knows Eventually, he is comfortable in doing them in the moment. But pastoral imagination can't develop unless there's a congregation. And congregational imagination or ecclesial imagination is a gift to the pastor who, in turn, is a gift to the congregation. And what this means is that the congregation's interaction with the mission of the church, with being the church, feeds into the pastor's understanding of pastoral imagination and who he is in leading the mission of the church. 
And the, the congregation draws that out of the pastor. The congregation can also contribute to the work of seminaries um, in, um, in having pastors or students who are not yet pastors and, work, and treating them as pastors as you would a pastor. So here's, here's the problem. If members never talk to their pastor, then the pastor never has the opportunity to confront that stressful situation where he's got to say, I need to listen to this person. They are coming to me for advice, and I'm supposed to give them godly advice. What do I do? But if the, if the member never comes to the pastor, the pastor is never going to learn, and the members will never be benefited. So have you thought about it that one way that you actually can contribute to building up the body of Christ is to talk to your pastor? Most of us would rather go to our therapist or to our counselor or to our friend. But actually talking to your pastor is an important part. If you saw that as part of your calling, particularly those who are a little more mature, that you're part of your calling and to help develop a younger pastor. Um, we have a former a student who used to work at the seminary. He's now a graduate of TED's, working at a congregation where that, that congregation sees that as their calling. And they have a very intentional program for bringing in new pastors. And every one of those pastors is called pastor. He's regarded as a pastor, and they talk to him like they would to their senior pastor. That is an amazing congregation. And that would be a remarkable way to develop pastoral and congregational imagination. So that's one point. Um, the second one is, do members actually consult their pastor? Here we have this great gift we can give pastors. And, and, as, and as pastors are formed, it also keeps them from burning out. There's such a high burnout rate among pastors. It's going down, which is good news, but it's still way too high. Being a pastor should be a calling, not just a job for 10 years until you can't stand it any longer, or the people drive you out. That's a horrible way, horrible way to um, change, you know, to abandon a, a vocation. Well, the kinds of issues that pastors said they talk, that people talked to them about were post-abortion, so not pre-abortion counseling, but after the abortion, infertility, palliative care, Withdrawal of treatment like feeding tubes and ventilators. Suicide, and one pastor's first shocking sort of watershed moment was the suicide of one of his elders. I'm going to talk about a challenge. And then other end-of-life concerns. That's what they identified that people actually came to them about. Um, members would be most likely to talk to their pastor about end-of-life, particularly if it's something happening in the hospital and the pastor's visiting in the hospital. They would talk to pastors about infertility if they knew the pastor had gone through it, so pastors who openly talked about it, or it was a younger pastor and they figured they understand the whole infertility thing. The factors that were identified with whether they would talk to, talk to their pastor were, first of all, did he, if, there's, if he had taught on the subject, then questions would come up. Then they would go to, go to him with more questions. So teaching about it. Another one talked about what is their relationship with the pastor. Um, some were just wanting to understand an issue, so if they thought the pastor had some understanding, and there were a couple who actually had some um, significant medical experience in their background. Um, they might when they were uncertain. And one pastor said, quote, the questions are, number one, what should I do when my loved one, my father or mother, is suffering? And secondly, what should I do about the fact that we can't have a baby? Those are the two main areas where people ask their pastor. Now, some were looking for affirmation or encouragement. They just kind of wanted, as Ian said, they want to rubber stamp what they're already doing so they can say, yep, Ian said this is just fine. So they just kind of, they're not sure, but they wanted his seal of approval. And some asked their pastor to help when they're having trouble, like with the doctors in the hospital and kind of navigating that whole scenario. One of the most interesting ones was where a couple, they weren't coming for help. They wanted to inform their pastor because they're going through embryo adoption. And does anybody not know what embryo adoption is? Okay, so embryo adoption is where there's a frozen embryo that a woman has um, implanted into her womb that is not hers. So you'd be giving birth to a baby that's not genetically yours. And rather than that embryo being thrown away or discarded, someone is adopting the embryo as their own child. Well, this couple is doing an embryo adoption. Problem is they're in North Carolina. It's a white couple, and it was a black embryo. So... Here's how Vance described it. I think they understand the fact that this was going to be a complicated issue. They weren't asking our opinion. It was more just informing us. They recognized the fact that the elders and the pastors would need to understand and be able to talk about how and why this Caucasian couple gave birth to an African-American baby. Not making medical history, but something needed to be explained. 
The assumption of those who did not know the facts would have been that the woman was immoral. They met with me. They met not to get my opinion or advice regarding the ethics of the procedure, but to help the church prepare for the ramifications of their decision. And it didn't, it didn't work out. The baby didn't make it. But that was the most interesting consultation I read about. Um, so awareness and avoidance. <coughs> Pastors wish that, they, that the people had come to them sooner. This pastor of an African-American inner city congregation said, I wish more people would come and trust me or trust a pastor with helping them navigate those difficult issues. I have a shepherd's heart, and I'm sure that, a lot, that there are many pastors like me. And Quentin said he often finds out things secondhand when I can't be of much assistance other than to pray for the people. So there's awareness and avoidance. People might not be aware that they are ethical issues, as one of you mentioned earlier, um, because maybe the pastor's not giving it attention. The pastor himself may not be aware of the issue or that it's an ethical issue. Uh, it might be new Christians who aren't familiar with the evangelical church and that you can actually go to the pastor as a resource. They just don't know sort of church culture and that that's what pastors do. It just is kind of alien to them. Um, others might not be aware of the, the effects of their behavior or, quote, have just made up their own mind, and they don't feel like it's that big of an ethical issue that they have to talk to a pastor about it. So avoidance, which was, so they're, are they aware? But the second is, why did they avoid? You can probably guess why people avoid talking to their pastor. See if any of these occur. First of all, they don't want to hear what the pastor might say. They suspect that he might maybe raise some caution flags, and they don't want to hear a caution flag. Or they don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. Paul described a typical scenario, quote, for instance, people who want to conceive beyond the age of, oh, 35 or so, say, we want a baby, and we want a baby at all costs. I think Paul might say no, so that's, Paul might say no, that's the wrong decision. So we are not going to go anywhere near him because I don't want to hear that. I want to do what I want to do. And if there's a problem later, well, we'll have the baby, and then Paul can do whatever he's going to do. It may be their perception about the church. They might perceive the church as unloving or judgmental, particularly if, say, there's been a sermon about abortion. You know, you talk about speaking out on these issues. If a pastor does that, he runs the risk that no one will ever come and talk to him about post-abortion trauma, depending on how he handles that in the pulpit. It might be that they're worried about their image. As you said, they, they don't want the pastor to know what they're struggling with. Paul noted that in the case of abortion, quote, a lot of times those decisions are secret decisions, and that's no surprise. Some avoidance factors relate to the pastor himself. He's um, too young to know anything, or he might be too old to know anything or care about infertility. They might not trust him, or they, they might think he doesn't have patience. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not getting counsel. They might go to the pastor's wife, who finds out more about some of these things related to abortions and infertility. They might go to their friends, other people in the congregation, or a Christian doctor. So it's not that if they don't go to the pastor, it's not that people aren't getting help and good counsel. They just are getting in other places, and we don't necessarily know how much that is. So just real quickly here, typical member of your congregation, naive cultural Christian, immature, learning but unaware, connecting, learning with living, or serious about living a faithful Christian life. So let's just say, if you think about the majority of people you know in your congregation, how many would you say are serious about living a faithful Christian life? All right, got some hands there. Connecting, learning with living, more. Learning, but just unaware. So this might be like a seeker-sensitive congregation. Immature, that might be this congregation uh, where um, they just didn't know that the pastor was a resource or a naive cultural Christian. So we're just, it's kind of like this, I was raised a Christian and that's what I do. Well, let me close with the story of another pastor. All the 25 evangelical pastors I interviewed have some level of confidence about leading their congregation on bioethical issues. Some were younger and some had more than 30 years of experience and some were second career pastors. And they all had an interest in bioethics. And one pastor stood out, and I'll call him Zachary. He's the founding pastor of a large church in the South. This congregation is very pro-life. Their members include parents and the child they tried to abort, so abortion survivors, children with disabilities. The church operates a mission in the heart of one of the, uh, the largest underprivileged areas in the city. 
It's not just a crisis pregnancy center. It's a fully licensed pregnancy medical clinic. It provides free holistic women's health care. There are classes on baby care, food shopping, getting a job, and they provide everything a mother needs for the first 12 months. Clothing, food, high chair, car seat. If the mom needs financial help, they provide it. If she decides to abort, they still care for her. And Zachary says, our church is all in. And their members still struggle with issues like rape and incest. So even though they're very pro-life, that's a hard one for them. They deal with infertility. Pastor Zachary talks about these things openly. He prays for infertile parents on Mother's Day. And he says, quote, I just try to create an environment where they hear me talk about it openly. And so his congregation will come to Zachary and ask him, Pastor, what are our options? How far can we go and still be honoring and trusting the Lord? Is there a line? And when are we crossing it? And he and his wife have shared openly about their own struggle with infertility. So he went on to describe how he and the other pastors teach their congregation. If you are making any decision that is at all a spiritual decision, and what decision isn't, to not include the ones given to you by Christ to watch over your soul makes no sense at all, quoting Hebrews 13, 17. And he said, amazingly, our people come to us with just about anything. So Pastor Zachary, is the, for me, is the ideal pastor, but not everybody is a pastor of that kind of a congregation. But he models a lot of the um, aspects of how do you help a con not just the pastor, but a congregation to be a congregation that is being the church and not just doing church.